Hey, so people feel crazy, obsessed, ruminating, can't stop thinking about, or wanting to go back to a toxic person over and over and over. Okay, so this is totally normal after you've been with someone where you might feel trauma bonded to them. And what happens is we get in a state of what's called cognitive dissonance. We have two, confl two conflicting beliefs going on at the same time. So it's literally holding those two beliefs in your mind at the same time. They're horrible for me. Oh my gosh, I miss them so much. All right. The beliefs or desires are opposing. Your mind feels blown away by why you can feel like one thing for them and the total opposite, why you can know they're bad for you and still want to go back. It is, it feels like addiction. It feels like obsession. Well, this can go on and on and on and on and on with a person. This can go on for a long time for some people. Some people get over it quickly. So why does this even happen? Let's talk a little bit more about what is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive, cognitive dissonance keeps you locked in behavioral and emotional patterns. It keeps you locked in continually thinking about, oh my gosh, what are they doing? Where are they? Who are they with? Do they still care? Are they going to hoover? What's going to happen? You know, on and on and on. So it can keep us locked in that behavior and that pattern. And you can see that that's not a healthy pattern to have in any time in your life, like worrying so much about other people's whereabouts and what they're doing and all of that. So your actions go against what you know and believe when you're in a state or when you're feeling or experiencing cognitive dissonance. You're doing things that are completely going against picking up your phone to text a narcissist that you know better, that you shouldn't, that you've been no contact with for however long, right? So your feelings of discomfort are partly due to this conflict. So it's kind of a catch 22 where you're uncomfortable because you're feeling cognitive dissonance and you're feeling cognitive dissonance because you're uncomfortable. So it's sort of a, a feedback loop, right? That goes on with us. And you can see a lot of what I'm saying is the word behavioral, the word loop, the words, the words that show that the, the more energy we put into these beliefs that are so gripping and so conflicted, the more we're feeding the beliefs that are so conflicted. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, I'm going to read here what I have. Here's the thing. A narcissistic person has shown you the potential of what is good for the most part. Not all of them. Some are just purely awful, especially if you are the child of one. Look, let's talk about when you've had the love bombing, when you've had a part of the relationship that feels like home, that feels like safety, that feels like someone loves you or cares about you, a piece of it, right? So they've shown you the good and the potential for what is good. And um, they've, they've, uh, your love and your affections have grown toward that person and towards that aim. All right. So you have linked this person means my future. This person means my um, feeling good, my feeling good about myself, whatever it is. Okay. And when the rugs pulled out from under you, when they inevitably devalue you and when they hurt you and betray you um, or shame you, the response in our brain is this, this cognitive dissonance. How could they do that? Why would they do that? Who would do that to someone that they love that can't possibly be what's happening but it is what's happening and I see what's happening. And so you've got literally on each shoulder the logic and reason of what's gone on and the emotional response to what you wish it could be and what you wish it was and what you wish to bring back. Because, of course, you're feeling like it was you that made the mistakes. It was you that caused the problems. If only you had done things differently or you're just you know everything and you can't figure out why you're thinking this. Right. Um, so you're holding both of these truths. Our brains are amazing. Okay. They hold, thank you, Smiley, for your, is that a sticker chat? It's very cute. It's a little kissy thing. Okay. Um, so keep going. So the gaslighting in a relationship, when you're with a toxic person and they gaslight you perpetually all the time, gaslighting you, it sets up confusion and disbelief and creates cognitive dissonance because your mind knows what your reality is. Your mind knows what your truth is. Your mind knows what happened. 
and you're being told the opposite or you're being, the truth's being twisted, everything's getting conflicted. So a piece of you is holding on to your truth and a piece of you is starting to believe, boom, there's cognitive dissonance. It is confusing. It is cognitively confusing. The more you go down the rabbit hole of being in a toxic relationship, the more that the, that relationship has power over you and the longer you're with them, the worse it gets. And the more confusing and conflicted your mind becomes because of it. It is, it's terrible. So here's the thing that makes it stick. This is the glue, intermittent reinforcement. If someone every Tuesday gas did had a gaslighting episode and then every Thursday decided to project on you everything they hate about themselves and pretend it's you, you'd get used to it. You'd walk away or you'd stay in it and be like, oh, it's Tuesday. Oh, here we go. Right. Who cares? Whatever. It's Thursday night. They're going to do the thing. Right. If there was some regularity to it, our minds could figure it out. In, in a way of like not assigning any other beliefs to it. We would see that there's a pattern. When you have intermittent reinforcement, when you have intermittent devaluing, the confusion state is what, it's like the glue that sticks all of this to our cognitive awareness, to our our thinking. And um, yeah, and then you you throw some trauma in where you're dissociating, you're checking out, you're, you're, fighting it, whatever you're doing, you're reacting to it. And you can't tell up from down at a certain point or which way you're supposed to believe. So the thing is that it, it's, it's set up by the way toxic people are in relationships. Okay. And so that's all to say that. So what do we do? What do we do about it? Okay. If this is going on for a short period of time, if you've just left a narcissistic relationship, if you are, you know, in the process of discovering it with like your parents or your partner or whatever, give yourself a little time. This is normal. This, this is what we go through. We almost all of us go through some form of this. It's, it's very normal to feel this. So give yourself some time and listen perhaps to some of these ideas and see if it can help you. If you have been in this a long, long time and or been out of it a long, long time away from the toxic person and you're still feeling the ruminating about that person, you're, it's like obsession with that narcissist. When you feel it to the point of that, it may be time to do this seriously. Okay. It may be time to take it on it is about behavioral changes. It is about pattern changes in yourself. Patterns set this up. Patterns get you out. Your own patterns, your own choice to get out of it. It is, it has to be choice. You have to do for yourself what I wish I could do for everyone and just like pluck it out of them. We have to do it for ourselves, unfortunately, but it is. Um, it, so let's go on to the, what I'm talking about here. So look at the facts of the person. Look at the facts of what you experienced. That is the reality. Stop listening to the emotional response of the yeah, but. The yeah, but right now is not valid. It's a lie. You're, you're, what you're looking back to with the good was a lie. It wasn't a truth. And some of this may hurt what I say, okay? Because the unfortunate part about cognitive dissonance is what holds us in that um, state of wanting to believe that it could be better or wanting to believe that they weren't what they obviously are hurts to hear the truth of. And, and we often like we'll get mad at the messenger or we get mad at ourselves for even thinking it, or we feel guilty or we feel ashamed or whatever it is, accept it, accept a crocodile's a crocodile, a shark's a shark, a narcissist is a narcissist. A toxic person is a toxic person. And someone that hurts you hurt you. Okay. Accept what is real and what happened. It's, we're always darting and looking away. I got to look at, it's, it's not a scary thing. If you can accept that it is not happening right now, this is in the past. And the only way to get through it is to accept it. Okay. Learn what you needed and give it to yourself. So narcissists, we know they, they read what we need and they give it to us in the love bombing stages. If they did that. I know not all of them do, but for the most part, most of them do. So, cause that's what keeps you there. Cause why else would you stay unless you're a helpless child and can't get away? Right. And even then they're going to love bomb in some way, a lot of times just to keep you from, you know, running away or like just to keep you, um, sort of on the hook with them. Right. So learn what you needed and give it to yourself, yourself in ways separate from any relationship. Um, 
discover who you are. Yeah, that's a big one. Okay, <laughs> that's a hard one, but really it's part of the process. So, so maybe it's a matter of stating I need to understand what it is I needed. I need to understand what it is I still require for my life. And I need to figure out how I'm going to give that to myself. And that's okay. I don't need to know right now. I just need to know that that's where I'm headed, right? All right, talk about it. Find someone to talk to. Whoever it is, as long as they understand cognitive dissonance, as long as they are not judging you for feeling stuck and, and attached to a toxic person, because a lot of your friends are going to be like, yeah, you're better off without them. Bye. And they're not going to want to hear you go on and on and on. So find someone who has been through it or who can support you through this and talk it through. All right. Whether that be a friend, a relative, a therapist or a coach. Okay. And, um, at the end, we'll talk about where you can find coaching at least. Okay. So journal. If you are not opposed to journaling, write it down. Write down the conflicting thoughts. Write down how the conflicting thoughts and then the logic side. Write down the parts that don't make sense. And then write out to yourself, explain to yourself why you need to listen to the logical side. All right. It's you you want to list the toxic things they did. You want to have that list. Read it. Read it often. Accept it. This is true. You might want to say these things are true. And and listen to other survivor stories of what happened. And do you believe them? Of course you do. Do you believe yourself? Start to learn to. Start to listen to you. Okay. Um, and then I have gratitude written down. And what I mean is finding things in your life to enjoy that have nothing to do with relationships with others for a little while. In other words, find your own joys, simple, little, teeny, tiny, itty bitty things in your day to take your focus off of the toxic person. Remember, this is patterns. So, so here's the thing. When you are ruminating, you need to stop. You need to be a little bit stern sometimes and just stop. If, if, if this is fresh and new for you, um, maybe this part, you can be a little softer with yourself, right? But if this has been going on and on for you, and it's very difficult for you to break this cognitive dissonance way of thinking, realize you're in a distorted way of thinking, and you need to stop. It's fantasy at this point, you are fantasizing about your conflicted thoughts, and you're trying to resolve it. This is not resolvable, you cannot take the toxic behavior and the good behavior and make it make sense. It doesn't make sense. Okay. The only way it makes sense is to understand who they were, what they are and how they interact within relationships and let them have their stuff and don't take it on for yourself. For yourself, what you're looking for in your life, you need to know what do you want in your life? What kinds of interactions do you want? What kinds of affection do you want? What kind of energy do you want around you and influences do you want around you? List those things on a piece of paper. Does the narcissist fit those things 98% of the time? Okay, let's give them, let's give people a little credit. 89% of the time. My guess is they fulfill those things 20% of the time, if that. Because when they're good, they're really, really good. But it's short-lived. And the longer you're with them, the shorter lived it gets. Okay. So um yeah, we need to we need to be clear in our heads about what what the reality was. So more more tips for for healing this. Create, be creative with it. Art, poetry, songwriting, um sculpting. It doesn't matter. Anything to get it out of you in a creative way, representational even, so that you can just let the emotions have a place to go that isn't back into the cycle. Okay. Cause right now it's looping and your emotions are feeding your emotions are feeding your emotions and on and on it goes. Right. So to get out of that, we got to hop out of the cycle. Sometimes getting it out of ourselves, being creative or being active or being, um, uh, I know the best thing I did for myself was Pilates. I mean, honestly, it sounds ridiculous, but it was getting out of my head and having to stop thinking about everything for one hour to focus on doing movement that if I did it wrong, I might hurt myself. So I'm pretty clear that I'm not going to do it wrong. Right. And listen to what someone's telling me and just stay in the moment with it 
helped me to learn to do that outside of there. Does that make sense? Like we have to interrupt these patterns. It really is a pattern interrupt process. All right. So do some extroverted things. One thing that I have read is that people who engage in extroverted activities and life tend to heal faster from trauma. I'm sorry, my introverted friends, I being one of them, but this is, I don't, I don't have the quote of where I found that, but that was actually done. That's actually a thing. Okay. So that doesn't mean you got to go to a party or go in the middle of a crowd or, or whatever, but doing things that aren't so internally focused. Let's put it that way. When we're just like always worried about what we're feeling, always worried about how we're feeling and what's going on and what are they doing. And we're taking the external and pulling it inward, which a lot of us introverted people do a lot. And a lot of empathic people do. We're pulling everything inward. We're ruminating. We've got to be more external. So that can mean just allowing yourself to not be thinking and observe instead what's around you. Does that make sense? So you don't have to go out and go to a party. What I mean by that is go out and observe the external world. Go out and look at things. Pay attention. Decide to, if you're ruminating and ruminating and ruminating, you can't get out of your head. Go out into life and decide to find particular things like scavenger hunt for your brain. Keep your mind on it. When it wants to float back to fantasy, pull it back to what you're doing. It's silly, but it is um, more directive and it is interrupting the pattern of rumination. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I have here is accept that you saw flags and didn't know how to stop and that now you can stop. Okay. You can get this person out of your head. It is up to you to find other avenues for where to put your mind. Okay. If you have something in your life and what I've heard, hey, Elle, thank you so much for your chat sticker thingy. It says, keep it up and it's bouncing a, oh, it's doing the exercises. Yes. Okay. Um, anyway, the um, kind of an important thing. If you in life have something that is exciting, takes your attention, takes your focus, requires your focus, requires your... Um, gets you excited, gets you like super focused on it. Your mind isn't going to hold this rumination quite as hard. So seeking things externally and internally that excite you, both balance it. Seeking things that give you focus, give you meaning, give you purpose. Having purpose outside of your own head helps a lot. Okay. Because right now we sink back in our head and we ruminate when we're feeling that way. And we ruminate, it feels like it's about the other person, but really it's about making sense of the yes and the no and the right and the wrong and the good and the bad and the two conflicting things. So it's sort of like we need to kind of like push it away. Like it's a, like it's a curtain or like it's fog and actually look out for something interesting to take our attention. We want things to steal that attention for a moment so we forget to ruminate, okay? You're not gonna forget the pain or the person and you're not, it's just, if you can get out of it for a little while, then your brain gets in the habit of not sitting there in the rumination. All right, that's it for today, you guys. I'm gonna read chat for a second and then we're gonna head out of here. This is just shorty for you guys. Let's see, Um, go back to the beginning. Hey, it's Mebo and Tanya. And Darlene and Yune, hello, hello. Um, I walked away from everything I own to save myself. That's right. And you're doing it. Uh, a funny coincidence, says Darlene. I was watching the replay of Lisa and Angie's stream when this got this notification. Hey, hey. <laughs> I was thinking about that when I decided to come on here because I thought, when did I say I would? Okay. Um, Let's see. And L, thank you so much. And thank you again for your little exercise guy and your your super chat there. Um, let's see. 
Darlene says, I had so little confidence in my opinion that even if I was looking right at something that second and was told I was wrong, I would still believe I was wrong. Exactly. It is about building that confidence again or building the trust in yourself or building. See, you have somebody twist things enough and you start to doubt yourself. It's just the way it goes. So get things that you know are true. This is a pen. I am holding a pen. It's silly, but it teaches your brain to trust yourself again. And then as things, and then of course, do it with bigger things besides the silly things, right? Um, let's see. Learn. Uh, Darlene says, I need to learn to give myself permission to do fun things and enjoy life without feeling guilty. What is the point of feeling guilty, <laughs> right? It doesn't help anything. It doesn't change anything and it doesn't help us heal. Feeling guilty will not help you heal. It'll keep you stuck. So let's talk about guilt sometime soon too, because I think it's a big one for a lot of us. All right. Um, uh, let's see. What do we got here? Hey, you and a, uh, since you were groomed to doubt yourself, says you and a, you'll probably take some time, some looking and double checking your choices and opinions. Yes. You're allowed to have your opinions. You certainly are. Um, and Tanya is encouraging you to have some fun. Okay. You guys, I'm going to head out. I'm going to see you guys probably tomorrow. Tomorrow. Are we Wednesday tomorrow? Yeah. Let's, let's come back tomorrow and check back in. So you take care. I'm Lisa Colucci, one of the life coaches at queenbeing.com. I'm over there with Angie Atkinson. If you need any information, if you need any support or any help, there's all kinds of help available. You can find in the main description of every video, there is help for group coaching, which happens Every week, three times a week, we meet on Zoom, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 4.30, Fridays, 11 Pacific. And right now, always, always please, if you're watching this in replay, check with me, email me. It's also in the main comments four times in case they change. Um, and so there's that. If you need it, $60 a month for four weeks of three times a week. It's it's a good package, great group of people. Anyway. If you need individual coaching, I am also available. You can check me out down there. If you need, uh, want to join the Facebook group, which is a large group of survivors who, you know, it's more of a peer group, but Angie and I are both over there as well as the other admin and coaches. So um, head over there if you need it. You can always call me out over there and I will help you if I can. Um, that should be in the main description as well. Anything you need, just check it out or email me. I'll get it to you. Okay, I'll see you guys later. Hit the thumbs up, hit subscribe. Bye. Take care.